Okay. Yeah. Everybody in? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm just going to say a quick welcome. Um, I know many of you. Um, if I don't know you, I hope to meet you afterwards. I'm Chris Halver. I'm the executive director of the Pine Bush uh, Commission, and welcome to the Discovery Center. Um, all I'm really doing is saying welcome and giving you the important points. So if you need to use the restroom, they're out that door. <laughs> and if there's an emergency and we need to exit, we go out these doors and you go right out the front door where you came in. Don't no confuse the two doors. Do not <laughs> confuse the two doors. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Darwin Rosa, the president of the Friends of the Pine Bush Community, for our event tonight. Thank you, everybody, for being a member of the Friends of the Pine Bush community. And thank you for coming out tonight to celebrate our 10th anniversary. And the Friends group was formed, uh, obviously, in, in May 2005. And we've made great progress getting involved with a lot of projects. And we've, we've done it through memberships, through donations, through applying for grants. And we've had uh, a lot of successes. And we really look forward to your participation with us uh, in, in keeping you as a member, getting you to contribute or contribute even more from year to year. What we want to make sure that you, uh, you do tonight is celebrate with us by enjoying some of the uh, baked items and food items from Yonder Farms. We have for you, when you leave at the door, a little token here. This is our, our commemorative Friends 10th Anniversary Refrigerator Magnet. or we'll put it anywhere where it'll, it'll stick. We uh, want to point out that uh, if you have any friends or anybody that you know who uh, is not a member, get them to join. So by the door, there are some uh, membership forms. They can join online, or they can take, you can take them the paper form. They can become a member uh, by sending us a check. We are very, very pleased that one of our members, uh, his name is James Suozo, has offered to uh, match uh, donations and new memberships this year. So starting in May until the end of the year, he will match up to $5,000 in new memberships and contributions. So you may have seen out by the desk uh, this graphic. It's the graphic of the pitch pine, and you'll see that we're at about the uh, we're about fifteen hundred dollars from our goal of five thousand dollars. So we're getting there, and we thank you for being part of that this year. Now our board members uh, meet monthly, and you're welcome to, to come at any time. It's usually typically the uh, uh, first Tuesday of the month. And board members, I'd like to introduce Robin Cabanos, Sue Sippert, Cypher, excuse me, Karen Gleisman, Ellen Kubek, Mike Matthews is in Botswana, Africa with his wife, so he's on leave until May, uh, Richard Naylor at the back, I'm Darwin Rosa, uh, Mike Venuti, who is out ill today, and Val Washington, who is traveling through the south. Now, uh, I have the pleasure, especially uh, tonight, to uh, present to our treasurer, Robin Cabanos, uh, a check from James Suozo. He contacted me a couple of weeks ago and he said, you know, at your 10th anniversary, I can't be there because I've got some other traveling commitments, but I will write a check for up to a certain amount. So we assessed what we had up through last week, and he wrote a check for $3,000, which I will turn over to So please help us get, uh, by the end of the year, by December, the rest of the way to $5,000 with the balance of about $1,500. So thank you, everyone. Now, what we're going to do now is go to our uh, special guest speaker for our celebration, uh, Jack McEnany, as you know, is a uh, former uh, New York State Assemblyman. He is a very, very noted uh, historian, an expert about Albany history in particular, and we are really delighted to have him uh, tonight. When I contacted him to speak, I, I said, Do you, will you need any props? Will you need any notes? Will you need any uh, information about what we'd like to have you speak on? He said, I'm a storyteller. He said, I am a person who can entertain and yet be informative. So with that, we 
go to Jack McEnany, and thank you very much. Thank you, Darwin, and, and you, Chris, for all the good work you've done. We go back a, a number of years here, and I thought I have to give another talk on Thursday for uh, Archives and History Month. Now, are you hearing all right? Yeah. Okay, there's an echo somewhere, but then it's Halloween, so ghosts. Uh, <coughs> but uh, th that talk is going to be how we teach history wrong, and we usually start by taking somebody who doesn't know about the topic and take them to an area that they know absolutely nothing about and then we move forward and halfway through the lesson you've already lost them. <laughs> so what I've always been an advocate of is flashback history and start with the world that we know and explain how did we get it. And the world that we know, I was over there reading all the timeline and the dates and the legislation and little oddities about uh, the pine bush and uh, I noticed that they mentioned that the city uh, took the pine bush, bush back somewhere before World War One, and then the next notation is two generations forward and we're talking about the 1950s and that sort of tells you where the pine bush was for much of its history most people forgot about it. It was a no man's land. It had a few isolated areas that we can talk about, but in general, compared to the intense activity down on the other end and up in Schenectady, not too much was going on in this very sparsely populated and unique area. The pine bush that I remember, now I'm 72, as of August just passed, and so I grew up in the 50s. Those were my grade school years. And in the 50s, my father and I, my brother Terry, would come out in the pine bush. We lived on Terrace Avenue for a while. Eventually, we settled down on uh, North Pine Avenue. But when we lived on uh, that end of town, we were very conscious of the pine bush because the city, the developed city, began to... Um, began to become very thinly populated. If you weren't right on Western Avenue, you went in a little bit, and that was open space. As a boy, I used to go out on my bicycle, and the, uh, the Washington Avenue, which was always built as this enormous cement road, would come to a grinding halt at Fuller Road. A little guy had a uh, hot dog stand there, and that was about it. And you'd go beyond that, and there were sand, we called them the, uh, the sand plains. We didn't never use pine barrens or pine bush. It was the sand plains. And then you could wander around unsupervised to your heart's delight. You could dig tunnels in the sand. And uh, we were always impressed by the quicksand, because there are areas, some of you know, that retain uh, water. And at 10 years old, 12 years old, it's very thrilling. And if you do this often enough, the water will come out and it will turn into uh, quicksand. But for acres and acres and acres, it was very little. There were the ruins of an old uh, tuberculosis fresh air hospital, which was little more than uh, barracks. And I remember they weren't terribly interested or we would have spent more time in them. And then when they built the Harriman campus on the city end of it, the, um, uh, as you move into the city, when they built the Harriman campus, everybody knew it who lived on places like Terrace Avenue and Euclid and Lenox and Brevador Street because their clocks stopped, because there was a fine sand that was constantly in the air and you had to brush it off your car and it would just permeate everything. That's what people thought of with the pine bush. It was either something that either didn't register or perhaps registered uh, negatively. An unusual place. Eventually, development began to encroach on the pine bush. So how did we get this strange place in a city that was 300 years old? It's almost 400 now. How did this huge, open, unique space develop? And I think to understand that, we have to flash back. We have to talk about the city of Albany and what founded it. And it was, of course, along the river 
and there was no point in putting it further north because it wasn't navigable, because you couldn't get your sailing vessel uh, north. And then, of course, there was the Mohawk someplace up here, and that became the way you traveled. That was the throughway of the day. You traveled by water. So a man named Killian Van Rensler knew that the company was building a fort. And the fort, which was called Fort Orange, was built in, uh, in 1624. They had a hard time getting people here. It was a very difficult thing. You were up here, there's the French further to the north. They would love to take over the uh, Hudson Valley the same way they did the Champlain Valley. They were moving in through the uh, Iroquois territory of the Mohawk. It wasn't the safest place to be, but it could be a lucrative place to be. And the people who were attracted were people trying to make a buck, and they were making it on the fur trade. And if you have this image of Dutchmen, you know this was a Dutch colony run by a private company, the Dutch West India Company under license uh, from the Netherlands government. If you have this image of Dutchmen roaming through the forest wearing wooden shoes, bopping beavers on the head, that's not how they did it. But what they did is they met the Native Americans and said, we got some real neat stuff that's not available to you and if you bring some of those nasty furs to us, we'll take them off your hands. And you know the definition of a bargain, when, when each side is convinced they're screwing the other. So this, this lively trade went on. And it almost, in fact, in 1686, when the city gets a charter from the crown, the beaver uh, trade was dying because they had wiped out these animals as well as all of the uh, fishers and and mink and other uh, other critters, and you were going further and further, or the Native Americans were going further and further to go to new forest lands to get more animals. This is toward the end of the Little Ice Age, and Europe was freezing, and they had wiped out their furs. So it was a very lucrative market. Well, let's go back to 1624. You're having men come. You've got soldiers who work for the company, private company. You've got merchants who want to trade. Nobody wants to actually live there and stay there for a generation. So there was a diamond and pearl merchant. He was on the board of directors of the Dutch West India Company. And he had a scheme. And his scheme was, if you will bring settlers, because that's how you establish a colony, that means husbands and wives and children, and you'll support them for a number of years, then we can give you a grant on one side of the river, maybe a little shorter, but on both sides of the river, and if you'll support them for a number of years and make sure they have livestock and tools and what have you, then these will be the settlers. And so that year was 1629, and the land that he was given was basically almost all of Rensselaer County and all of Albany County. An enormous, enormous estate. And it was called a patroonship. Because the Dutch, who had no royal families, because they were always under the uh, heel of the, the Spanish or somebody else over history, they also had a lot of wealthy merchants who were nouveau riche and didn't have titles. So the extra bonus is, if you do this, we will give you an hereditary title that you can pass on to your sons or your nephews, and you will be a patroon. And so the patroons came in, and Killian Van Rensselaer, who was no dope, knew that it was a pretty wild uh, place. He never made it here. He's, I think he sent his nephew over next. So he said, I'm going to go down here where this fort is. And here I've got the company. I can get out through the ocean if I have to, or my people can. Give me an estate, and I, this is going to be an insert, which will be all of today's Albany County and most of Rensselaer County. And here's the fort. Here's where the river gives out, and then you have to go and find the Mohawk River. And I'll be protected. My investment will be protected. I'm not in the middle of nowhere. So 
there was a battle royal because in this Rensselaer Wick, as the estate was known, there were three judges appointed by the patron, there were armed guards, and there was very little economic freedom. So you were brought over to be a farmer, period, and you'd be given land. The land would be rented to you. You had to clear it, but it was going to always be rented. How long did the estate last? Well over 200 years. It's still on paper today, the manor of Rensselaerwick. It was an oppressive system. And what did those armed guards do? If they caught you doing something else or engaging in trade, all of the land rights, it's like uh, Spanish law, the king owns everything underneath the dirt. So if they find gold or you find coal, even the streams, if you want to build a mill, you can't do that. All water rights, all subsurface land rights, they're all reserved in this case, to the manor of Rensselaerwick. So it's a pretty impressive system. Sooner or later, anybody who really wanted to trade gathered around the fort as much as they could. And they said, no, no, we, we, we're on the company's territory. We're not in this manor of Rensselaerwick. And there were arguments back and forth. And finally, in 1652, a Polish sea captain, because if you were a Polish Protestant, the best place you could go in Europe would be go to the Netherlands. And the Netherlands picks up a whole motley crew of people who don't fit in where the dominant religion is somewhere. And this works in reverse uh, for other faiths. So surprisingly, they have a lot of Polish sailors. And they have, this guy was a, uh, he was a, a Polish, he was number one or two. They come up the river, shoot the cannon, insist that the, the, uh, on the authority of Peter Stuyvesant, who's the governor, runs the company, you will fly the company's flag. And it's not just Fort Orange. So now we need a little negotiation. Well, what's the fort? And what belongs to this oppressive system? And so they decide that one cannon shot from Fort Orange will be the village of Beaverwijk. That's Beaverwick, right? And every, everything else is this oppressive system. Now the boundary is someplace up along here. And that's the end of this Rensselaer Estates. It's about 16 miles up. Move fast forward. The British come, the British take over. They take a look at all these Dutchmen, they reappoint most of them. Somebody like Livingston does very well because he's a Scotsman who speaks both English and Dutch. So he becomes a first clerk, for example, later on. We all know the Livingston family. That's why the Scottish name. They were a, a Protestant dissident family, moved to the Netherlands, learned, uh, learned Dutch, and then uh, they moved back and came over here. So now, you know how cities grow. They go up and down the river over the course of time. Not really. Around that mid-1650s territory, people start to think, well, wait a minute. The Native Americans are coming from there. They go as far west as Michelle Mackinac. That's out through the Great Lakes. We call it Detroit today. If we can head off these Indians, because they're certainly not going to go by the Cohoes Falls. They're going to come down here somewhere. So a man by the name of Arndt Van Curler, Arndt Van Curler, he starts a little settlement up here, Schenectady, the place through the pines, outside the estate. And now we've got a problem. Why did he do it? He wanted to farm. Yeah, sure he did. So then they build the King's Highway. And the King's Highway is about 16 miles long. And as long as you're on the King's Highway, you can get up there, but you still have a problem because the Van Rensselaers, if they catch you fur trading, they're going to take your furs, they're going to fine you, they're going to do all kinds. They control all trade and commerce and industry in the, the estate. In the manor, later on the British will name it the manor. 
the manner of rents or wage, which still exists in, on paper. And so, in 1686, we all know that uh, the city of Albany is upgraded. It's given a royal charter as the incorporated city of Albany, and we get our first mayor and so on. The year before that, the negotiations with the British colonial government, the merchants of Albany said, you know, don't, don't throw us into this swamp again. We are having such trouble trying to be a prosperous, healthy uh, community. You've got to protect us. So even before the patroon ship is turned into the manor of Rensselaer Way, when they get their charter the year before the, their agreement, there's a cutout. And the cutout is on both sides of the King's Highway. And it goes all the way through. We're not sure where, but we know it crosses the magic line. So all the trade and the commerce that goes on between the trading with the Native Americans, the Native Americans themselves, anybody who wants to come down into the stockaded fort, they can do that. This, by the way, is Clinton Avenue. And this would be Third Avenue and Woodlawn Avenue and so on, all extended all the way up. So that's how Albany, which will go eventually, as all cities do, up and down the river. That's how Albany has this odd piece of land that goes 16 miles into Schenectady. It's to protect the highway, and this is your main way uh, west for many years. Move fast forward. The, you have a few taverns along the way, a little bit of very marginal farming, not a lot of settlement. And the state of New York, in its wisdom, comes up. And they go in 1795 until 1802. They start building turnpikes to the west. One turnpike, Western Avenue, is the Great Western Turnpike. And it goes like that. That'll get you to Buffalo. The other one is the Mohawk Turnpike. And that starts at number one Central Avenue, which is an 1805 building still standing down on the corner of Lark Street. And they go and they build one that way to get you into Schenectady. This is Route 5. This is Route 20. Here's all trade and commerce is forever bypassing the old dirt road of the King's Highway. And what was a sparsely populated area becomes virtually abandoned. The history of the pine bush during the 19th century, remember in 1981, Mayor Corning was homesick. And so I sent him a note. I was one of his commissioners for a dozen years. I sent him a note, and it was a quote from the pine bush book. Remember, you probably got it right here. I'm sure you do. And it said that there's an area to the west of Albany that's in the city which is so desolate and so unproductive, description like the face of the moon, or at least how we envision it, that not even a dead dog should be dumped there out of respect for the dog. <laughs> so I sent it out to Mayor Corning, who had more than a passing interest in the, in the pine bush. And he sent a note back saying, who wrote this, uh, uh, Supervisor Sanford and Colony? <laughs> the, the two of them had different, different opinions on it. And uh, the suburbs, of course, were, were fighting development all the time, and it was just a, a huge force. So this area here becomes really almost nothing. It's a great place if you're on the land, if you've got problems, you go out into the pine bush, you can disappear. Some of the taverns, Truax Tavern, 1792, has a reputation. You go there, you might disappear. If you're a traveling salesman, you can be robbed or worse, etc., etc. And any farming that's going on, once you move too, 
too far in from Route 20 or too far in from Route 5 tends to be very marginal at best. Meanwhile, Route 20 is booming. It's booming with cattle and trade and commerce. Same thing for what we call Central Avenue, Route 5. What's going on? Pine Bush is virtually forgotten, considered unproductive, etc. The city of Albany so valued the Pine Bush that, well, first one annexation, they annexed Arbor Hill as the fifth ward of the city. That gets annexed. It was the town of Colony, which went, went all the way to Oak Street. It wasn't what you and I think of. And they added a fifth ward in 1816. And then 1870 is the next big day when they start adding land along this way and along this way expanding to the south end going up to North Albany. But to make up for that they decide look we can't govern all that so everything on that side of Fuller Road is given away to the town of no such town exists at that point it's called the town of Water Vliet. Believe it or not, then they establish the city of Waterbury, and they start looking for a new name, and they kind of like that colony, and that's when it went in there, probably around uh, 1895 or so, when uh, Waterbury got incorporated. So all of this land, starting with uh, this line here, is given to the town of Waterbury, who valued it so highly that in 1871 they said, "We don't want it." <laughs> give it to Gilderland <laughs> all right so you can see how valuable this land was meanwhile a couple of things in, in history the railroad the first railroad went in there in 1831 and more railroad tracks and it got improved even though it crossed outside so let's remember there are railroads here and down on this lower end we have railroad tracks and they continue further west but just outside. In 1910, the city of Albany was thinking, eh, maybe we should take that land back. And so they started expanding and they went to they went to the town of Gilderland, which now controls the Pine Bush. Every bit of it from the other side of, uh, of Fuller Road. And they said, we'd like to take it back. And Gilderland said, we've got two problems with that. First of all, it's kind of ridiculous out here. Nobody can handle that. Why don't we cut it short? Because we know you, you can't go in there anymore. The line stops at the old manor line, which is the Albany County Schenectady line. But I'll tell you what, that boundary doesn't make any sense. So what we'll do is we'll take a distance from Route 20. And this is Route 20, so we'll put a new imaginary line down this way. And, and we'll go down to the Crumkill Creek. And we know we're taking some land here, so we'll put a point on it. And I think the point goes that way. And that's how Albany wound up with all that. They lost one piece of the original Dungan Charter and they lost it down here. So there's an imaginary line down the middle, which is Lydia Street, Madison Avenue today. And the city divided it all into great lots, which was a major source of land fraud. So what would happen is you wait, you buy some land. It was always going tax delinquent, but it had a street address. Great lot number 34, which is the same as uh, 5,280 Lydia Street. And you'd wait for the preferably non-English speaking immigrant to get off the, the boat. And you say, I have, I got a city lot here. I want to sell it. I'm moving west. You know, I thought we were going to stay in Albany, but we got to go, I'm willing to sell it. And so they would sell whatever this huge number of Lydia Street was, and then some unsuspecting 
emigrant would come up. This would be in the 1850s or 60s. They, because we're back in the 19th century now, they would come up usually by steamboat, and they go and find the equivalent of Hackney, equivalent of a cab, saying, "Take me to whatever it is, uh, Lydia Street." And you'd go. You don't really want it, don't they have it? You, they have it, but there's no road, and it's in the middle of nowhere. And so, what do you do with that kind of land? You sell it to another unsuspecting immigrant. So. Land like that was always going tax delinquent. It would be, it would be um, foreclosed. Somebody else would buy it. It'd be sold to somebody else. They'd lose interest, and so it was a constant source of land fraud uh, and that that type of thing. But that's how we got it all the way out there, and really not much happened. And throughway went in 1954. There wasn't a lot of development. I could go out there and play and dig all my tunnels and so on and so forth. And the development of this undervalued land was something that was put off until a time that's in most of our memory. And that's the, you know, geologically it was the bottom of the Great Albany Sea and it was far enough away from the shore that you have pure sand everywhere and it developed a very unique uh, place. I remember. When I was a kid in Albany, we didn't call trash garbage. Garbage had food in it, trash did not. And you were given a garbage pail, and the garbage pail was about that big and round, and you would put food stuff in the garbage pail. And the city would take it, and we were always told it went to the pig farms out on Rap Road. You had a settlement of uh, Mississippi blacks from Shibuta, Mississippi, uh, many of whom are still there. They had a development in, uh, in uh, Rap Road where they recreated the conservative, uh, Bible-believing rural South because they felt with the housing discrimination at the time, starting in the 30s, certainly the 40s and 50s, that you didn't want to raise children on Green Street the down, uh, uh, downtown where there were bars and uh, houses of prostitution and all kinds of things going on and gambling. So you would, if you had a family, called Holiness, a very conservative Southern uh, Protestant church. Uh, but with that exception, there's not a lot of development that goes on in the pine bush. And it's sort of the second thought. I remember Mayor Corning told me that he personally took responsibility for the water tower that was past 155 and I said why he said because I got them to put it there because I didn't want them to run uh, Washington Avenue any further west it was bad enough it went as far as it did uh, a tiny little piece uh, was given away of Willow Street about 26 acres otherwise it wasn't changed and what you've been living with today is a totally different attitude on what is really a jewel recognized, as you know, as a national natural landmark and recognized for its very unique uh, properties, but it has been a struggle. Now, we used to say you have to have 2,000 acres for the Carner Blue. The goal is really, so we're above that now, and the goal is really about 4,000 acres. Now, I, I'll go back to where I started. In the city that I grew up in, we walked everywhere, we went everywhere on our bikes. We had no electronic toys, so <laughs> a whole different thing. And when you would go over on Central Avenue, if you looked in the windows, you would find the shop windows on Central Avenue would be filled with Carner Blue butterflies. These endangered Carner Blue butterflies were all over the city, not just out here in the identifiable pine plains, but actually they were all over the place. And they were the same corner blues, that very attractive blue that we're all uh, so admiring of today. But that's how, how we got the pine bush. It's been a struggle. The Rap Road, uh, the other end of Rap Road has the, the landfill, which is a, 
a major problem, but its life is limited right now. How much longer that's going to go, I don't know. That's a, another challenge that's out there, a political as well as an environmental challenge. I take full credit for stopping it from coming west. You know, that's a, a long legislative story. And for putting the pine bush on the uh, list of about, at that time, 16 places that received money from the Environmental Protection Fund. And, and for expanding the preserve to include the county and more uh, private citizens on the, uh, on the commission. But it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle every step of the way, purchase after purchase, donation after donation. And I want to commend to all of you for caring about something which is very unique that we want to pass on to our uh, children. So with that, I'll stop and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Jack, um, the the dotted line that marks the that's the, the county line that right, and it was the end of the manor. How did that get determined? I missed that part. Uh, that roughly speaking, what they offered. You, what they offered you in 1629, if you would take on this, a certain number of people you'd sponsor and take care of, and so on. They offered you about 16 miles deep and 20 miles of frontage. And the Livingstons eventually wound up with an estate, the Van Cortlands, the Phillipses. There was even a, uh, a Jewish Dutchman by the name of Gomez who had an estate, at least on paper, down in the, uh, uh, down in the Catskills. And these hereditary patroonships, this title that could be passed on, uh, had varying success. We judged them more. Uh, Sunbach Kim, who taught at the State University in the History Department, wrote a whole thing about living on these estates. And what eventually happened with that system is it blew up with the anti-rent wars. But this lasted, this estate got locked in by the British declared a manor, and the family usually refused to sell land. And in 1639, a man that most of us revere, uh, Stephen Van Rensselaer III, whose cousin was, uh, now he's the third longest tenured mayor of Albany, he was a member of Congress, he's the founding father of all kinds of activities, including Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, named after him. He died, and everybody discovered why he was the good patroon. He didn't collect the rents. Now the rents down here on the valley floor, where you could get to a turnpike, get your goods into the city, the rents were 34 bushels of wheat, uh, two fat fowl, and the use of a wagon and team one day a year. That's with you driving it, or you hire somebody to drive it, and what you do is you work on the patroon's roads, all right, the farm roads. The Van Rensselaer Proctor, he could negotiate. You know, I didn't raise wheat, but I have sheep, and how many sheep people eat, whatever, right? Up in the mountains, in the Heldebergs, and over in the east in the foothills, like down in Berlin and Grafton, foothills of the Berkshires, you have short growing season, horrible transportation to get your stuff to market, and very thin soil. And so the, the heirs to the estate were two half-brothers. And they immediately went and expanded the Van Rensselaer Mansion, which was down in North Albany. Uh, <coughs> got name brand architects, put two wings on it. That was Stephen Van Rensselaer IV. He was given for the first time. The estate was broken. So Albany County went to Stephen. And then Rensselaer County went to his half-brother, Philip, and he built a mansion, which is today St. Anthony's on Hudson. That mansion is still standing. And they, all of the people that the uh, estate owed money to had been very polite when the good patroon was alive. Now they began to press, and they began to sue the estate. So what the... Van Rensselaer half-brothers did 
is they began to use their pull and start to evict people from their land. When you got into the uh, valley floor, the land had value. You could raise money. You could get a mortgage on the property. You could buy it. They were pretty well ready now. They were ready to sell it. But when you got up in the hill towns, there's no money. Nobody's financing it. At one point, the Albany County Militia, the 25th Regiment, same one that was uh, here during the Civil War, with a man by the name of Colonel Church, who was a relative of the Schuylers, he actually took cannon and what we call the National Guard and went up to get the ringleaders. The story of tin horns and calico, uh, dressing up like calico Indians, reminiscent of the Boston Tea Party, uh, the tin horns that they would blow to signal one another, basically to terrorize deputy sheriffs who had a warrant to uh, throw somebody out of their homes. It's a very bitter, nasty period. And eventually, people lose their land. Some of them went west. Consider when this is breaking up. They went out to the gold rush. There's a whole bunch of them from Rensselaerville that went, and they found all the letters and published them a few years ago. But a lot of these areas got abandoned. And Civil War comes, but so does the Homestead Act. So if you want to stay farming, go west, get your 160 acres. And if you look at population statistics, particularly in hill towns, the side of the hills, the top of the mountains, you'll find whole towns that drop down to, like Town of Providence up in Saratoga uh, County once had something like 1,400 people in 1810. It was down to 300 people by 1950. And the forest reclaimed its own. These are the anti-rent wars. Financially, the Van Rensters sold to Colonel Church. And he went bankrupt on it. And then the estate had lawyers. You never get rich for that. Pardon me. <laughs> some. And they'd have to settle. And land was financed in one way or another. The family's reputation got pretty much ruined. The Van Rensselaers moved out of Albany and saw, uh, sent the mansion over to Williams College. They took it down. It had turned very industrial. And they moved down to New York City. And then they invested in things like coal mines in West Virginia. But the Van Rensselaer estate that lasted the longest was gone. At one point in the anti-rent wars, which were civil disobedience, and it, uh, there were a couple of murders and deaths involved in it, tar and feathering. Uh, eventually, nobody won. And there was actually a, a, a state convention in 1845 that said, we can't have this semi-feudal estate sit situation anymore. It is now outlawed in New York State, except we don't make laws retroactive. I can remember probably 20 years ago, people would tell me anecdotal stories that they had a piece of property over in East Greenbush. And they, some people came up from like Westchester County. They thought it was great. They got to the closing and <laughs> they were looking at the, at the uh, deed. And of course, the history of the deed goes, goes back. And on the bottom it says, Shallow, uh, 34 bushels of wheat, two fat fools. You know, you could just see yourself waking up with nightmares of being chased by fat fowl, carrying the bushels of wheat. And on at least one occasion, it just queered the whole deal because the guy who was a, a legalist, and the lawyer says, oh, nobody pays any attention. And he said, no, you got to have a sign off. And there was, I remember in the 70s, you could look up the Van Rensselaer estate in the phone book. Remember phone books? Yeah, and, right. <laughs> and they had Van Rensselaer Estate, and an attorney owned it, and for like a hundred bucks, you could go down there and he'd give you a quit claim deed saying that they gave up all rights to the fat fowl and the bushels of wheat and so on. But that that whole like I I got to laugh. I'm I'm very much supportive of some of the uh, food that we give to poor people and they decided to set up a farm up in uh, the town of Knox. They call it the Patroon's Acre. But let me tell you, <laughs> nobody thought the Patroon was that great up in the town of Knox. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, it's a little off the, the pine bush, uh, before I was in public office, 
I was working with Marie Lounsbury, who was a very progressive teacher, sort of like Fiore over here that I see with the butterfly uh, cage over in Farnsworth. And she was always looking for different things, etc. She set up a program with kids of Giffen in Albany South End, most of them children of color. And the kids of Burns, all of them not, would pen pal back and forth. And then the kids up in Burn would take a bus, usually with volunteer uh, drivers, down to Giffen, and I would take them. They get to meet whoever they were writing, and they would walk and see the Schuyler Mansion, and you know, look at high-rise buildings, and all it was a culture shock. Well, then the next month, we take the kids from Giffen, and they would go up to Burn. And downtown Burn is very different, right? <laughs> and, and I always remember once. I took the kids on a walking tour of Burn, Burn Hamlet. It's only about five blocks long. We got in front of the Dutch Reformed Church, uh, which is like the second oldest Dutch Reformed congregation, believe it or not. It must have been, the others must have been missions, because I'm sure there were others. But it goes back to the uh, pre-revolutionary time. They had a sign, the building's probably from the 1870s. And, and I'm talking about the church, and believe it or not, people were really up here, and that was the Helderberg Trail and so on. I'm talking about the church, and this little kid that is next to me, and I love little kids because they are so much more honest than the big kids that you have to deal with, especially in politics. The kid's got a miserable face, and he's got his arms folded, and he's just not a happy camper. And I turned around and I looked at him and I said, something wrong? He goes, the landlord's church. Oh, I said, oh, I'll bet that you go to church in that pretty pink brick church across the street. Palatine German, Dutch landlord. Yeah, 150 years, not time to forgive you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That was the church where the Lutheran minister was thrown out and all his books were put out on the lawn and it rained. Oh. And everybody was appalled at that. And that was in the, in the 1850s. But stories like that sure. have been told at that kitchen table for generations. So much so because it says Dutch Reformed Church. That's the landlord's church. You never know what mm -hmm. what comes down. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I was a student here at one point, and uh, and it always seemed to me, but tell me if I if, if, if I'm right, that things really changed. So I remember that Washington Avenue ending. Yeah. When Crossgates and New Carner happened. Is yes. That, is that really what you also know? This. Yeah. Uh, it, like. Everything seemed to explode. There was a need for land. It was cheap land. Crossgates, Mrs. Corning never shopped at Crossgates. Told everybody that. Um, you know, and it was, you know, there were promises that Crossgates was going to put in paths, nature paths, and so on and so forth. And, you know, it was a cheap price to pay for it. And there were lawsuits back and forth for all development. And that battle goes on today. But, um, it got particularly intense in the late 60s and all through the 70s and 80s, as my memory would have it. Yes? I have a question. Sometimes I think it's a story, a much reference story, that the name Schenectady was misapplied to the city of Schenectady, that the Native Americans were actually talking about that they were coming to Albany through the Pines rather than they were leaving the Pines. I think it's the path. The path through the Pines, yeah. coming or going, yeah. Still path, still the pine. Yes. Was there, I read somewhere on Wikipedia or something, when I was doing some research on the Carnivore Butterfly, mm -hmm. that there was, there was an area between the city of Albany and Schenectady somewhere in <coughs> Gilderland or something that at one time was called um, Carner. Carner. Is yeah. that true? It's there. Uh, you know, I'll tell you right where it is. Oh. I left something out that you'll find interesting. But, uh, yeah, Carner is Route 155, and you know where the post office is? And there's Carner Road and New Carner Road. 
and the road goes down here, this is where Carner was. And why is it there? Because the railroad would drop you off. Um, uh, a little railroad community. Oh, okay. And another one down in Northway Mall. Uh, I remember once the Corning government was somewhat unique, uh, what you'd find in a textbook recommended. And Corning used to make up his own budget. Well, they had taken the Empire State Plaza, you lost 10,000 people and all the taxes and so on. So when he'd make up the budget, there was never enough money for it. And if he raised the taxes, more people would move out. So he would be flexible. <laughs> and when he made up the budget one year, this was early 70s, the budget balanced perfectly, as it always did. And down at the bottom, it said, might have been like a million dollars something, sale of land. And the reporters, impertinent as they can be, said, what are you selling? And his answer was, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> the land that he sold was some of the uh, some of the water within the watershed of the Six Mile Waterworks, which went over towards Central Avenue, and you know where Nolan Road is, and, and so on, in between Fuller Road and Northway Mall. The land is where Northway Mall was built, but around there's a couple of little streets in there, and those were people had summer camps on them. They were little summer camps. It's hard to imagine that today. I did want to mention one thing. What the city line looks like today, if we can fire the van right, is something along these lines. And the original city line went like that. And there's a little triangle here. And the imaginary Lydia Street goes here. And here's the Carillon, and here's the four dormitories of the university. And this is the Crumb Kill. It's a creek. It's underwater at that point. That's the city line. So this little triangle from the original Dungan Charter is under the State University, which is why Indian Quad is entirely located in Gilderland. And the next one up there, Colonial, is half and half. And the Board of Elections, when nobody wanted the kids, used to actually ask you what floor you were on and which number <laughs> and try and divide it diagonally. For the census, it's counted in Albany because the guy who took the census in 1980 made a ruling that the front door address would be used. So that gets counted in Albany. Close to a thousand people in it. And this one goes here. But the rest of the line looks like this. And that's the colony line. What's that? Gilderland. Why? Why is Gilderland there? Shouldn't they have given it all to the city of Albany when they gave it back in 1910? I've always wondered why. He wanted access to the river. Nope. Well, remember the railroad tracks? You know all those railroad avenue warehouses that pay taxes? They didn't want this part, but it didn't touch. So they took about 400 feet, and they kept it as Gilderland when they gave it back to the city of Albany, and it went all the way down. Down here, they're actually interested in it, because that's a lot of tax money over the last 105 years because that part of the railroad is in the town of Gilderland and pays taxes to Gilderland. And then this part here, going over parallel to Western Avenue, that additional uh, land sort of makes up for the loss of land up there and probably this little strip as well. And also it makes more sense. It's an even I forget what well, it's a quarter mile or, uh, in from Western Avenue. Can yeah. you go back to you, the first map that you did? The good art. Yeah. So um, what were 
the years generally of the beginning of the settlement on Rap Road of people from the South? There's a, um, a book that yes. came out, and it's basically 1920s and 30s. Okay. So but there's uh, a big parcel of land bought in 1954, and I believe a Jewish go-between bought the land and turned it around in six months later to the Wilburn. So what, what schools did uh, the children of those families Albany. go to? They, did. Okay. they went to Albany. They went to Albany High. Wayne Jackson, who's okay. our sergeant at arms, is an Albany High grad. He just got brought into the uh, uh, Hall of Fame. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The little chunk of Willow Street those kids, it was too expensive to bust them, so the city of Albany paid them, uh, paid them to go to the Gilderland schools, and then they said we're not going to do that anymore. So they petitioned to uh, 36 acres or so that they were going to leave, and they had public hearings, and nobody objected. And one guy changed his mind on the north end at the last minute, so it's really like 24 acres.